Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, my goodness, thank you all. I'm so excited to see so many people here. Um, welcome, happy 2021, woo, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can all cheers to that, right? Let's go ahead and, and raise that glass, guys. Raise it up high. Um, it's a new and drink and drink. Yes. Um, very, very fun and exciting. I'm so excited to see also what everyone has brought to the table, so to speak. Uh, if anyone wants to show me their, uh, their snacks or tell me what they've got, uh, please jump in. Anyone? I, of course, am doing my, as I mentioned, I have a Sancerre today because I love Sancerre. Um, it's a delicious, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sauvignon Blanc from France, the Loire Valley. And it happens to go very nicely with, I don't know if you can see this, goat cheese which just fell onto my computer. Um, totally fine. And <laughs> also delicious. But um, that's one of sort of uh, considered sort of like a typical perfect pairing, if you will. Uh, and I'll talk about why. At any rate, today is, um, I, I was having so much fun putting this together because this is one of my favorite topics. It's one that people ask questions about a lot. Um, and it's one that's, uh, it's, it's like most things about wine that I love, it's actually much simpler than, than many people think and is actually um, much easier for everyone to do than they think, which is really exciting because I like to empower the people uh, to make right wine choices. That's, uh, that's always my goal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at any rate, I, I have a few people kind of like dripping in. I'm just going to kind of vamp like I do in the beginning of for just a moment more. But um, but yeah, so this is I'm, I'm happy to put this together and share it. And I think it's one that really does invite conversation. So I understand that there is quite a lot going on in the world right now. If you need to leave at any point, of course, that's fine. But at the end, if we want to have a little discussion and have questions, by all means, please, I'm, I'm here to do that because I think this will be a fun one. And also, I think that um, you know, if you have questions later and you want to email me at any point, I'm always available. So that's part of that's part of what I do. That's part of why I'm here uh, to to help out and give insight where applicable. So, um, okay, awesome. I am going to go ahead though. We're at 5:04. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Get started as always. Or for anyone who is new, welcome. I always forget to do this, but um, my name is Sasha, and I am Vina Lust, and I am enjoying doing these. Lovely webinars with you guys, uh, always here to do that. Jim and Janice, Will Willamette Valley and Pinot Noir, and now you'll add potato chips. <laughs> you should always have some on hand, they're good. Um, all right, let's go ahead and I will get this going. But yes, if you have questions, of course, throw them into the, um, into the chat box. I'll make sure to keep an eye on that with everyone. And um, as always, they're the basics of food and wine pairing, which really, um, what I do want to point out is that there are some very, very basic, simple, uh, simple components to pairing food and wine um, to kind of give you uh, the, the confidence to, to go into a restaurant or to go into a wine shop or to order your wine online and know exactly, you know, with confidence that you're going to enjoy it with the food that you're eating. Um, and like I said, it's exciting because it's simpler than you think. So um, to begin with, we have the basics of food and wine pairing, of course. Um, and I wanted to start off with a quote. Now there's a really great book and I, I forgot to pull it down from my shelf, but it's, a, it's out of print now, but it's called Red Wine with Fish. Um, and it, as, as the name would imply, it sort of um, is, is a, a talk about food and wine pairing from an alternate perspective that sort of goes against contrary to what these sort of prototypical uh, rules are to pairing food and wine, right? And in this case, he gives us a very clear uh, answer as to what the three, the three things are you need to know. So I'm going to read this as I go along just because I love this quote. So uh, to become an expert on matching food and wine, there are only three things that you need to know. One, the taste of every wine in the world from every vintage. Two, the taste of every food in the world from all producers. And then three, how every wine and every food will taste together in every circumstance. So you guys, that's it. That's all you need to be uh, an expert at matching wine and food, at food and wine pairing. So as you can imagine, the point he's making, of course, is 
there are no experts on matching food and wine because it's a fluid thing and that's what makes it really fun um pairing wine and food is part of the you know the icing on the cupcake of exploring wine right it's this idea of experimentation matching and and trying new things together and that's really how all the great pairings of the world have come to us and there are so many more yes i know cheryl it's a great quote and um it's also a great book again it's called red wine with fish and if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about kind of the concepts of food pairing and just wine in general um it's a wonderful one you can you can get it sort of used i bought mine used um last year just off of off of amazon i think there was still used copies for like i don't know 20 bucks or something it was it was definitely well worth the spend so uh that's great and sandra was just saying um Cali white blend and Vietnamese vanilla wafer cookies had chips with it early. I like that. That's really, really interesting. Delightful. Uh, the, and because, you know, cookies are always sort of those biscuits digestives. I feel like vanilla wafer cookies kind of fall into that category. I like it. Um, so the nitty gritty of food and wine pairing is really what I kind of start off with because there are just, let's just dive into the basics so you can walk away with things that you feel like you can work with. So the truth of the matter is that most people don't realize is that most wines are going to taste pretty good with most foods. It's actually the things you have to work to worry about are avoiding the bad pairings, which we're going to talk about what those are. But in reality, most wine is going to be pretty fine. Uh, but there are ways the whole concept behind food and wine pairing is this idea of enhancing the experience, right? taking wine, taking food, taking two separate components, bringing them together to create an even better experience of both. Um, and that's where the sort of joy and the art, let's say, of food and wine pairing comes into play. Um, but circumstances and context also affect pairings. Um, what does this mean, Sasha, you may ask? Um, I'll ask how many of you, and you know, you can raise your hand or answer, how many of you have ever perhaps traveled to a, a, foreign, a foreign country or even in California to wine country and sat out on a beautiful deck and with the sun shining down, a gorgeous glass of rosé and you taste it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing wine in the world. I need to buy 10 cases right now and bring it back home with me and share it with all my friends. And then you do that and it's okay. <laughs> This is this is a real thing. Um, this happens uh, because the reality. I know, Alessa. I, everybody is guilty of this because this is part of what makes food and wine so exciting. It's about the experience that you're enjoying it in, right? Having um, having wine in a beautiful place is going to enhance the your enjoyment of that wine and that food. Um, the people that you're with, the environment, the 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 whatever the context is. Um, so these things also play into a factor, not quite in the literal way that we're talking about when um, we're talking about actual flavor profiles, but definitely in terms of how you experience and appreciate the wine. Um, then, of course, we have this idea that speaking of experimentation and risk are is the only way, these are the only ways that you can discover new and incredible flavors. Uh, and it's great to know what you like, and it's always know what you like and knowing how much, and depending on how much you drank is also true. Yes, that's very true, Shelly. Um, but this idea that, you know, you can always stay with your go-to and I definitely have my go-tos and I love to pull them out because it's easy breezy, but the only way you really kind of uh, push those boundaries is by experimenting and trying new things. Try something you think would be terrible together. It might be, or it might be a totally mind blowing, uh, delicious experience. And so the point is really try as much as you can in as many different combinations as you possibly can. And then the truth is that actual taste is 100% personal and subjective. So the bottom line of any pairing is that if you like it, it's a good pairing. So if if, if you like to have saw turns uh, with anything, I mean, but also that's kind of... <laughs> Okay, but uh, I'm trying to think of a bad pairing right now. But if you happen to like those things together, you like that combination, it's a go to winner, then 100% it's a good pairing, um, despite what any of the guidelines may tell you. So when we're talking about basic pairing guidelines, there are a couple things that are just going to be go to's when you are like, but what do I really need to know? if I wanna try experimenting, because obviously it's good to have a framework. So the, the basic ideas, concepts behind food and wine pairing is to either match flavors or contrast them. Very simple. So let's say you have a dish that has a cherry jus in it. You might want to go ahead and find a nice Pinot Noir. Um, you know, kind of the flavor contrast, the flavor combinations are similar. So the flavor combinations together will then enhance the overall experience of those particular aspects. Um, 
Similarly, it's the idea of also contrasting. This is your sweet and your salty. This is your sort of, uh, you know, finding the lemon, uh, the citrus in the wine with perhaps more of, you know, that's what goes nicely with sort of that fish. It's almost like the wine acts as the acid on the dish as well. There are different ways to think about that. So you think about um, either matching the food or the flavors in the food excuse me, the flavors in your food with your wine or contrasting them and creating sort of opposites to which enhance both of them. So that's kind of two ways of looking at pairings and you're really your basic ones, which is what um, we, we really kind of go down to. The other most important characteristics of uh, wine pairing with food is to always match intensity. And this is where oftentimes we can kind of fall apart because the truth of the matter is, is that wine, um, some, some wines are very, very intense, um, very, very flavorful. Think about a big, bold California Zinfandel. It's got a lot of flavor. It's got a lot of punch. It does not sit on the sidelines. It takes over. So if you pair that with some sort of delicate little, you know, beautiful nuanced, um, you know, herbal dish, uh, you might lose the flavors of the dish to the wine and then they will be mismatched in intensity and therefore not be necessarily a good pairing because you're not getting to enjoy both components separately. Uh, and similarly, the same way, if you have a really kind of light, delicate, aromatic wine and you're pairing it with some sort of asso buco, you know, uh, that has tons and tons of fat and flavor and all of this kind of wonderful, wonderful things going on, uh, you know, you're going to kind of miss out on the enhancement. It's not, it doesn't mean that the wine is bad. It doesn't mean that the food is bad. It just means that you're not really going to get the optimal enjoyment of both together in the pairing that you're making. Alessa is saying she did a pre-rot with a cherry mustarda topped steak tonight. Yay, cherries. Excellent. And this is going to talk about when we talk about, uh, you know, the food, it's not just the, the protein item, but there's all the components of a dish. There's so many things to pair with and to consider when you're, you're talking about pairing. Um, keynote, if your dish is high in salt, aka potato chips, for example, um, or acid, generally they kind of go with all wines. So that's why potato chips, excellent choice for pretty much anything. Um, it's salty. Uh, salt has a way of just kind of softening um, wines that have a lot of tannin in them and bringing out the fruitiness in wine. So it kind of showcases the best parts of the wine, which is what which is what makes it such a great also uh, kind of enhancer of flavors within food dishes as well. Um, works, works in conjunction with wine pairings too. Um, if you don't know, simple unoaked wines, it's, it's a go-to because again, it's not gonna blow your mind. It's not gonna be a pairing that you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that was a crazy combination. I can't believe I've never tasted anything like that. No, but you know what, it's gonna work. Uh, simple, and this goes for both reds and whites. If they're like simple, not, not a lot going on, but still delicious, there's nothing wrong with simplicity. We have to remember that. Um, simple doesn't mean bad. Simple just means simple, easy, easy to drink. One of those kinds of wines uh, and unoaked because oak adds things to the wine that can change the flavor profile and the interaction with food. So it's a great way to kind of start off anything of just knowing that that is part of it. Um, and then finally, a good, a good rule of thumb is always what grows together goes together. And this is where we talk about local dishes. This is where we talk about my Sancerre and the goat cheese, because uh, if you've ever been to France or you've ever been to uh, Sancerre, a beautiful little town called Chavignol is where they make goat cheese. And so these goats are eating the grasses that are uh, sprinkled throughout the vineyards. And you have this perfect idea of a pairing because literally the cheese is being made from the same earth that these grapes are being grown in. And there's all this kind of uh, symbiotic uh, confluence that's happening that really just explodes in your mouth in perfection. So, you know, just something like that. But it's a rule of thumb that if you're wondering what to pair with your wine, what's the dish or what to pair with your food? Where is your dish originate from? If you're, if you're eating Italian, drink Italian. Uh, you don't have to, but it's a good, it's a good idea to start from if you're looking at different pairings. What part of Italy, Northern Italy, Southern Italy? I mean, you have wines all over the place to choose from. So there's a lot of opportunity to pick those local wines. Um, so this is an important thing that I'm just going to touch on briefly. If you are joining me next week for the class series that's starting, which is the introduction to wine and wine tasting technique, we're going to talk a lot more about this whole idea and concept. But the structural components of wine are part of what we use when we we're talking about intensity and when we're talking about the wine itself for pairing. So our basic structural components of wine are sugar, which is literally the residual sugar that's left in the wine uh, after fermentation. Now, most of the wines that we drink uh, typically are dry, meaning that all or almost all of the sugar 
that originated in the grape has been fermented out into alcohol. This is your typical table wine. This is your typical all wine, um, unless it's a dessert wine. I'm typically speaking, let's say 80, 85% of the time. But sugar, when we're talking about wine, is not necessarily talking about the fruitiness, which may we may sort of think of as sweetness, but it's actually not residual sugar that's left in the wine. So sugar is referring to actual residual sugar in the wine. Then we have acidity, which is that part of uh, the wines that kind of makes your mouth water, a natural component in all grapes and therefore in all wine. Tannin, which is found primarily in red grapes, also in orange wines as well, which are made from white grapes, but they're in the skins of the grapes. And these are, tannins are astringent and they're bitter. Um, these are the components that dry out your mouth when you have a glass of red wine, you take a sip, sort of sucks all the moisture off your tongue. Those are the tannins that are doing that for you. Alcohol, of course, is a component of wine and it does make a difference because alcohol is warming. Alcohol is, is heating. When you have a very high alcohol wine, you can taste it. It starts to, when you get into your fortified wines where you have actual spirit added, you feel that warmth that can spread through your body. So this can actually be affected by the foods that you eat as well, your perception of it. Um, body as well, we talk about body, um, but that's sort of how light or how heavy that wine is, right? Is it is it a light body, medium body, full body? Um, how do you know? Uh, a comparison that I, I like to use for uh, understanding the body or weight of a wine is milk, actually. Think about skim milk versus 2% milk versus whole milk. Uh, think about the texture and weight that each of those have on your palate. Your, your whole milk is much creamier, much richer. It sort of coats your mouth, whereas your skim milk is much lighter, almost water-like, very almost cleansing, right, into your mouth. So that's the same concept when we talk about light, medium, and full-bodied wines. And then complexity. And this is where it gets into our little, uh, the little quote right under there. But complexity is really how many different things are you pursuing? Perceiving in this wine, how many different fruits, spices, flavors, textures. Uh, simple wines are not complex by nature, right? Uh, yet, if you have a complex wine, you might there. Usually, that comes from different winemaking techniques. It can come from the grape. It can come from uh, how old the vines are. It can come from you know the the climate as well. So there's a lot of components. The more complex a wine is, complex wines are ones that you sip and then they kind of make you think. You stop and you. You say, what am I tasting? Wow, what is that? And so to, to, it stands to reason then that the more complex a wine is, there's more elements in there that can interact with your food um, and with the food that you're eating, either in a good way or in a bad way based on the tastes that you have and how they interact with it. So when we're talking about tastes, we talk about the five tastes um, in particular, and how they affect the wine that you're drinking. So our five tastes are, of course, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and then umami. That's your fifth taste there. That's a very, very unusual one. A lot of people are more familiar with it now, but it's a very sort of, um, umami is used to sort of describe very indescribable other flavors that are not any of the, of the previous four. So kind of keeping that in mind, we'll talk a little bit more about umami later as well. But um, it's important to note, which I, this was revelatory when I, I learned it, but the idea is that the food is actually going to affect how you perceive the wine and its flavor more than the, the wine is going to affect the flavor of the food. So think about that for a second, because, you know, when we, when you're out at a, at a meal and you have a glass of wine, you'll probably take a sip of wine and then you'll have a bite of food. And then you take the sip of wine again, because inherently by following the wine with the food and then with the wine again, the wine is going to taste different, more so than the food will taste different with the wine. Now that's not always the case, but the majority of the time, that's the way it happens. So when we talk about bad pairings or when we talk about um, pairings to avoid or combinations, um, that is a good thing to remember uh, in terms of knowing those components of your food. Rachel is asking, uh, you think you call umami earthy, is that a wrong analogy? It's not. It is earthy. It is also a lot of kind of other things too. Um, mushrooms are kind of your, your um, quintessential umami. Um, uh, asparagus, eggs have a lot of umami in them. There's cheeses that have umami. There's a sort of earthy funk sometimes. Is a, I like to say funk because I like to say I just like to say funk. Um, so I like things that got funk. Um, but yes, I would say, Rachel, that's a totally appropriate way to kind of um, regard umami. 
when it comes to a flavor profile. So when we talk about how food affects wine, there's a couple things that we want to know um, because the food, again, is going to affect how we perceive our wine. So in this particular case, um, sweetness, aka sugar, and umami, these are your two most difficult flavors to pair with because both of these components uh, increase the perception of bitterness and astringency in wine. So what does that mean? It means that um, sweetness uh, and umami, they sort of enhance any sort of bitter flavor that you're going to get from tannins, from grape varietals, from phenolic bitterness in white wines. So they, they can be very, very tricky to pair with because of that. Um, the uh, acidity in food um, increases the perception of fruitiness and body in the wine. So that means that if you have uh, a food that has a, a very, very strong vinaigrette on it, right, or a lot of citrus or a lot of acidity, the wine that you're drinking is going to taste a little bit fruitier. It's not going to taste as acidic, for example. So you need to make sure that when pairing with a highly acidic dish, as a, a dish that has a lot of citrus or a lot of acidity in it, you need to find a wine that will be able to match the intensity of that acidity so that you don't get lost, so that wine doesn't get lost and overwhelmed by the food components. Uh, Sandra's saying the first lesson you learned about food pairing is always taste the wine first. And this is partially why, because the wine is gonna be more affected by the food than vice versa. Um, our next idea is salt, as we talked about, the perfect sort of ingredient for wine pairing. Um, why? Because it softens the wine. It decreases the perception of bitterness and it decreases the acidity in the wine. This is part of the reason why uh, salty foods, also fatty foods, can have a really, be really good pairings with sort of young um, and tannic wines. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear us talking and say like a wine, oh gosh, I need food with this wine because this wine needs food. Um, usually we talk about that when we're talking about youthful red wines, right? Uh, wines that are very tannic or wines that sort of dry out your mouth. That's because when you add, thinking, for example, of a Barolo, right? Super, super tannic grape. Nebbiolo is, has a lot of that kind of astringency going on, a lot of other beautiful things going on as well. Um, a lot of those Italian wines, there's a lot of the tannin, some more of the astringency. You add a little bit of Parmesan Reggiano to that, you get the salt, you get a little bit of that fat, suddenly that wine just opens up because the salt has changed the way that our mouth accepts those flavors of the wine and then expresses those to our brain. It's amazing. I think it's such an incredible thing. And then finally, spice and heat in food. This is a tricky one, right? Because chili, we're talking about chili spice. We're not necessarily talking about like pepper and things like that, but chili spice, heat, hot foods. This is where we talk about ethnic Asian foods or curries, things like that, where you have a lot of chili spice in the foods, Mexican foods as well. Um, this is a the very, very particular to pair with because this is going to amp up again that sense of bitterness. It's also going to amp up the alcohol. Uh, so if you have a high alcohol wine with spicy foods, you're just going to get pounded in the face with the alcohol impression. So just be prepared for that. But this is also the spice balances sweetness. So when we talk about, for example, Rieslings being a really, really excellent pairing with Thai foods or things like that, it's because a lot of Rieslings tend to have a little bit of residual sugar in them, which then complements the spice and the heat. So this, for example, would be a combination of contrasting flavors, right? Spicy food, slightly sweet wine, voila, you have heaven in your mouth. It's delightful. So this is kind of the idea of what um, of the different basics of pairing. So talking in depth a little bit more about a couple of these things, fat and wine, I mean, grasa, sabor, am I right? So the idea is that most people find the combination of high acid wines or tannic wines with fatty foods very satisfying. Now there's a couple of reasons for this, but to do that, let's talk a little bit about what kind of fats, because obviously we're looking at a great steak here, but fatty oily foods um, or even creamy foods tend to coat the palate. Um, and coating the palate, you know, it's like anything, you just have this unctuous layer of, of, of delicious, delicious fat all over your mouth. <laughs> Um, it can impair the sense of taste. It can feel heavy on your mouth. It can prevent you from being able to enjoy other flavor experiences because of that kind of coating. But what happens is that the acidity in wine will kind of cut through that fat. It'll act like a palate cleanser. It'll allow that fat to sort of dissolve and, and move on through the, through the entire um, flavor profile of your, of your palate and therefore allow you to enjoy the richness in a much more 
palatable way, let's say. Um, Roger is saying sushi is a tough match. What goes perfectly for me is a Gewürztraminer, the best ones from Alsace. Again, yes, Gewürztraminer is a wonderful, uh, a lot of times from Alsace, you might have a touch of residual sugar in there. These are also great with the, uh, with the sushi um, because the acid and the fish tend to be really nice together. Um, I'm sorry, the Gewürztraminers don't have high acid. They, they do have a, a little bit of ginger spice to it, right? There's this ginger spice component to Gewürztraminer. Suddenly you add that to your sushi, it's just like you're having, and then you're the pickled ginger. And then there's this, you know, this wonderful sort of combination of flavors going on there that really enhance and, and, and appreciate one another. Um, sushi is also great with any other sort of high acidity white wine is usually really nice, or even a nice uh, high acid red wine. Um, a lot of times uh, I find, um, Red burgundies can be really, really nice with sushi. They're lighter, you don't have the tannins. Um, you're not affected by the umami kind of from the fish and the tannin in the red wine um, with a Pinot Noir. It has a nice kind of flavor profile combination going on, which is really lovely. Um, and then as I were talking about that too, I mentioned tannins a couple of times because um, tannins in red wines can act a little bit like acidity when it comes to fatty foods. This is why you see a lot of those big tannic red wines being served with big heavy meat dishes because the tannins similarly kind of cut through that richness and allow you to appreciate the flavor profile of all of those a little bit more. Now umami, and we were just talking about this, is sort of the fifth flavor, earthy if you will, um, just sort of this other flavor. Um, it's, it's found in a wide variety of ingredients and like I said here, mushrooms, eggs, asparagus, some cheeses. The trick with umami is that it often is found in conjunction with other flavors. So uh, it can be very difficult to isolate on its own. So usually it's umami and or umami uh, with. Um, so when we talk about kind of pairing sweet, salty, all of these ideas, umami is, it's, it sort of covers a, a wider range and usually isn't on its own. So therefore you have to take in multiple considerations when you're trying to pair with it. Um, Rachel is going back to interesting, uh, she thought of Gewürztraminer as a dessert wine. It can be, but Gewürztraminer is not inherently a, a dessert wine. The grape itself can be made dry. And a lot of times in Alsace, you'll see them in both styles. They can be very, very sweet as dessert wines, but you can also get a dry Gewürztraminer. Dry Gewürztraminers are awesome. They are great food pairing wines. They tend to be a little bit fuller bodied, a little bit lower on the acidity. But I find, uh, for example, that they go great with sort of meat dishes like pork also, uh, braised pork and Gewürztraminer. Uh, excellent. Um, this kind of fun stuff like that. It's a white wine that has a lot of can, ha can have a lot of heft to it and just a lot, a lot more complexity. And mostly it's got that ginger spice component, which I find is really, really complementary to a lot of different dishes. So dry Gewürztraminers, even a touch of sweetness might work with the dish depending on what you're, what you're eating. But um, I would highly recommend trying Gewürztraminer uh, that is not a dessert wine. Uh, it does not have to be. So back to umami though, uh, we have the idea that umami um, is, is, usually requires a lot of uh, concentrated fruit flavors in the wine. So if you remember, umami emphasizes uh, astringency and bitterness. So therefore, to kind of uh, contradict that, you're going to need a concentration of fruit. So sometimes that means sweetness, but a lot of times that just means uh, fruit forward wines are really great for um, umami, low tannin wines. Again, you want the fruit itself to make sure it's very powerful and structured. So you can't just kind of go with a, a mediocre wine to kind of balance that umami. It needs, it needs some help and it needs a concentration of fruit flavor to really balance that earthiness. And then if you have a very high, high umami food, a lot of times you'll find that there is salt or acid with it that is balanced. Think of like ramen, think of, uh, you know, think of, think of like a ramen bone broth, which has a lot of umami to it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of salt in there as well, which kind of enhances that earthy flavor, but in a very pleasant way, and then makes it much easier to pair with when we're talking about pairing it with wine. Now, another tricky one is dessert and wine. So obviously there are dessert wines, which are can be dessert on their own. Um, and Sandra saying oxidative sherry goes well with mushrooms. Abs oxidative sherry itself, I feel like has got some umami going on it too. But yes, I love that. Um, oxidative sherry meaning sort of your Olorosos or uh, even your Amontillados as well. Um, very, very nice. It has that earthy quality. It has a lot of this kind of like just yeah, just like growth and texture and, and oxidation that 
in itself has its own sense of umami, right? Um, but so it's important to know that even though we have dessert wines that are very, very sweet, we have, you know, you have uh, a variety of very different dessert wines and not all of them go with all desserts. Some desserts actually need something a little bit lighter. Um, and you have this idea of, you know, uh, think about, for example, like, um, Chantilly cream and berries or something like that something light and delicate if you tried to pair that with a port it, it would sort of overwhelm the dessert itself so when we're talking about desserts and wine even if we're talking about dessert wines we still want to keep that idea of intensity and looking at the flavors that match or either contrast to each other to find a good pairing um, we talk a lot about or i should say it's spoken a lot about the idea of chocolate and wine being a perfect pairing I mean, that is definitely subjective because a lot of times um, when you have a very tannic red wine and you pair a dark chocolate with it, you're getting sort of a, a double combination of tannin there. So you're actually accentuating the bitterness in the wine by having uh, milk chocolate is actually even a little bit worse because a lot of times milk chocolate has more sugar in it and it also has the tannin because chocolate has tannin in it naturally and suddenly you're you're using both of those elements you're sort of doubling up on the tannin and then um, accentuating the tannin in the wine with the sugar that's in the chocolate so it is a little tricky a lot of times people still love red wine and chocolate I say go for it but a lot of times if you're trying to find a good red wine for chocolate what you'll find, I think, is that your, your sort of fruitier, um, fuller bodied, lower tannin wines, even sometimes like your Zinfandels can be really, really delicious with, with chocolates. Um, some Cabernets, if they don't have quite as much of that, but you have, uh, you know, even uh, chocolate, although um, uh, Sandra's saying she tends to default to champagne with dessert. I mean, champagne also kind of goes with everything. Um, I did a chocolate and wine pairing class before and what was really interesting it was actually, we did a Sauvignon Blanc and sort of a single origin chocolate. It was a little bit geeky, but you know, when you get into chocolates and you get into single origin chocolates, you'll get tasting notes on these chocolates and they'll say, you know, rose petal, orange blossom, um, you know, uh, candied lemon, things like that. And those, it's just the way we talk about that in wine. There are elements to all of these foods. And if you have that sort of nuanced um, uh, availability of information <laughs> on your chocolate, it can be really fun to pair with that. And white wines can go very nicely with chocolate. Uh, again, it's all about experimentation and finding out what you like. Um, but it is, uh, usually you'll find that softer kind of fruitier wines will be more delicious with the chocolate as well. And I'm glad everybody likes champagne. Yes, I know. It's, it's kind of, you can't go wrong with it. Uh, it really does kind of, it, it does pair with pretty much almost anything as well, which is kind of fun. Um, again, this is sort of what we're talking about. Consider the flavor components of a wine. Um, matching secondary flavors like coffee, toffee, or fruit can create really exciting pairings when you think about the base of the dessert versus what are the additional things? Is there a sauce? Is there like sort of a layer in there? Um, what are these other kind of things? And then finding a wine that kind of like a muscat to go with some sort of orange layer in a chocolate cake could be a really, really fun pairing um, depending on how those things taste to you and how prominent they are. Um, so just ways to think about that as well. Um, Sweet and savory. So obviously one of the classic combinations works with food and wine too. Uh, Shelly has got it going on. She's got her sauternes, which is a sweet wine and her blue cheese, which is very, very salty. Another classic pairing is your um, uh, port, is port like a, a ruby port and blue cheese because the port has that really, really sort of intense fruity sweetness and that blue cheese is so salty and savory and umami and putting them together, it's just like wonderful, wonderful, mind-blowing contrasting flavors. Um, so that's a really fun pairing to, to work with. Um, and then like we talked about, these sweeter wines can also complement the spice in dishes really, really nicely. And interestingly enough, there are, are times when you can get a, um, uh, yeah, you learned it from Peter, exactly, it's great. <laughs> Um, sometimes, like when you start experimenting with this, you might find that uh, you get a, and I've, I've heard about this with the port and blue cheese before, that you get a completely different flavor than anything that's in either of the two single elements, like um, like hazelnuts or something like that. Or, you know, uh, there'll be no hazelnuts anywhere, but suddenly you'll get this sort of by combining the two flavors of the wine and the food, you'll suddenly get a third flavor or a fourth flavor that just would never be there. Caramel, um, things like that. It's a really interesting way that these flavor interactions, and those are always the most exciting pairings to me because they're unexpected. Um, suddenly, you know, you're creating an entire new dish just because you're taking two separate components, adding them together, and voila, something magical has just occurred and created a whole new experience. It's a really, really cool way to look at it. Um, 
And just remembering that whenever we're talking about, you know, sweet and savory pairings, you still have to remember to match intensity. So the port or the sauternes and the blue cheese, sauternes with foie gras, of course. Yes, Roger. <laughs> no, but that is another very classic pairing um, that's sort of sweet, again, and that fatty and salty. Um, sweet and sauternes has a good acidity to it. So that's always really nice. But um, remembering that your intensity port is super intense. Blue cheese is super intense. They both go together because they're super intense. A Moscato de Asti and a blue cheese might kind of give you a similar thing. But really, that Moscato de Asti, so delicate, so light, probably going to be overpowered by the cheese, for example. So just remembering, always remember your intensity. That's really important. And don't feel limited. When you are experimenting, you don't want to, you don't feel you have to just do white wine with uh, fish and red wine with meat. That's what we have to do. It's, it's just, there's so many different combinations out there. Why limit yourself, right? Um, for those of you who are uh, back with LCA a while ago, um, my husband Derek and I had done a food and wine pairing where we paired three different dishes, both with one white and one red, so that we got to try the combinations of those different dishes uh, with both a white and a red, because really that's the way to enjoy it. Find out new, um, new flavor profiles, learn different things from that, which is really cool. Um, remembering that preparation is equally as important as ingredients. I, you can see here, um, We've got the, uh, I just, uh, we've got a beautiful fried chicken skewers. Um, and speaking back to what we're talking about, uh, we've got uh, the, with these, uh, these crispy uh, chicken skewers, voila, a perfect pairing champagne. I don't know if, how many of you know that. Who has had fried chicken and champagne? It's delicious because champagne, high acid, those bubbles cleanse the palate. Champagne is, again, this like perfect pairing wine, it kind of gives you that same awesome uh, effect. It pops like you have the crispy, crispy, uh, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> you have the crispy, uh, you know, fried parts of the chicken and the skin and like all the oil and then you get a shot of champagne. It's like, whoo, burst in your mouth. It's like a fresh, fresh burst of deliciousness. Um, so these are fun things to try. Uh, champagne with mac and cheese. Yes, why not? Absolutely. <laughs> Champagne with everything. Let's do it. <laughs> the Riesling with a, um, uh, Shelly is saying the Riesling with a spicy pork Mexican rice dish. Absolutely. Um, no, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to kind of uh, enhance those flavors, right? Because you have, it actually makes the spice taste better. It kind of cools it out in the mouth a little bit. It changes the flavor of the wine. The wine doesn't taste sweet anymore. It's really, really wonderful. Um, Masters are doing a bucket of fried chicken with a bottle of Vue for 70 bucks. That, I mean, that's a night right there, you guys. I think that's splendid. Uh, I highly encourage everyone to go find them and tell them to do that again. <laughs> but now you know why, it's great. Um, and then when you're kind of experimenting again, remember back to that first slide or one of those first slides I said, start with those structural components. That means how sweet is it? Is there a lot of acid? Um, are there tannins in the wine? Um, what are the flavor, what are what flavors are dominant in this wine, right? Or or in this food? Uh, start with that, then go to these flavors and just start to experiment from there. Mix and match. See what if you want to do a combo of um, of contrasting, or if you want to try and enhance a specific flavor that's apparent in both. Uh, a lot of times I like to do that with herbal kind of things, right? Because you'll find, for example, a lot of Southern Rhone wines, you get that beautiful gari, you get that kind of like thyme and like um you know, um, this sort of, uh, that the, this, the, this coat, the shrub, this sort of, uh, not coastal shrub, but general herbal sh uh, sh scrub that's all over the grounds in the Southern Rhone that took me so long to get out. Thanks for your patience, guys. But that can be a really, really great um, pairing element to dishes that have herbs de Provence in them, right? Uh, things like that. It's a really wonderful way to kind of find um, smaller details about it, which is really, really cool. Uh, and then finally, you know, how are you going to pair your next dinner? These are just some things to think about. So with everything that you've learned today, now that you're pros, trying chili cheese Fritos with a bold wine like Syrah. Ooh, strange. That might be, that might be tricky, right? Because your Syrah is probably going to have a bit of tannin in there, a bit more tannin than might be pleasant with the chili. Uh, you know, um, cheese again, it tends to be uh, with the salt in most cheeses, it tends to be a really good pairing thing. The chili is a little tricky though. You might be, you might, you might find that a little, yeah challenging. But, um, you know, start off with describing the dish. What are you eating for dinner? How would you describe it? Is it sort of delicate and elegant? Is it spicy? Is it a rich dish? Is it very vegetal? Um, starting with those components can then inform what kind of wine might pair with those in complementary or in, uh, in 
enhancing those flavors. Um, and then what are the ancillary flavors of a dish? You know, what's in the sauces? Is it a cherry jus? Is it some sort of, um, you know, uh, beurre blanc, for example? I mean, put beurre blanc on anything, you better get a white burgundy in there and enjoy those things together because you will be very happy. Um, what kind of spices and herbs are used in there? Again, is it is it spicy? Is it a chili heat? Thinking about those things and the ancillary flavors that are in the dish in addition to just the main components. Um, then what is the intensity of that dish? Is it a very, very flavor um, forward dish, then you need a flavor forward wine. Is it a delicate and elegant dish? You wanna go with a more nuanced kind of lighter style wine. These are just things also in body of wine too, like a light bodied wine versus sort of a more medium or full bodied wine as well. Um, the last and most important thing you need to ask yourself whenever you're doing a food and wine pairing, this is imperative, okay? What do you like? That's it. What do you like? What do you like together? That's really the most important question always when it comes to food and wine. Uh, and when it comes to like wine in general, what's your jam? Drink that always. That's my, that's what I have to say about that. So, um, so that is the, uh, our lovely little uh, soiree into food and wine pairing. Don is saying, hello, Don. My favorite combo is Sauvignon Blanc Sancerre with Thai and Indian dishes. Yeah, you get that beautiful kind of uh, rich uh, citrus quality that I think is, is, I mean, Sauvignon Blanc is, is a wonderful, wonderful, but it's a bold varietal, right? So you tend to have a lot of bold flavors that go well with it. Roger is saying, I find a high alcohol and low acid don't pair well. They don't. That's exactly right. Because that um, the alcohol, again, can be very, very easily enhanced by the chili spice. It can kind of cause astringency and bitterness. Um, acidity in wine usually helps to pair it with things. Salt and acid, again, these are going to be your two best friends when it comes to kind of pairing foods and wines together, uh, which is why Psalms and why so many restaurant people tend to be acid heads, just like me. Um, you get these a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to enjoy more wines uh, with the food when the wines have proper acidity. And acidity is one of the most important structural components of a wine for aging it as well. You can't age a wine unless it has proper and enough decent acidity in there to hold it for a long time. This is really, really important. I think I might have missed a question up here. I'm just taking, a, a, so someone took a junk food, Nancy took a junk food and wine class years ago and found that port is very good with a Snickers bar. I love that, right? Um, this is great. <laughs> Paul, I see you guys are really enjoying them too. Snickers, you guys, start pairing things with Snickers. This is great. So, <laughs> um, I mean, this is really, this is your challenge to all of you. Drink more and eat more together. Uh, it's homework. This is all I can say. Um, but I, I hope that, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone going to hear too many complaints. I hope not. <laughs> Happy New Year, you guys. It's great to be back and it's great to see you all. Um, cheers to the new year. Let's all go see what's happening on Capitol Hill or go to bed <laughs> or don't. <laughs> but um, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful, fantastic year to come. This is the start and it's just gonna get better from here. So um, wonderful to see you all again. Take care. <laughs>